So, uh, think about the top five things you do typically during a week. Okay, what are the, the top five places that you go? You know, some of you go to work almost every day of, of the week. Some people go shopping. If, if you're going to have a highlight of a week, it might be shopping. It might be going to church. You're all here today. You know, maybe it's, it's one thing you do every week or a school activity. Go to the post office. Just any place. Go to your family. Go to your friend's house, right? What are the top five? I just listed six there. But uh, there's think about the top five places that you go. And what do you usually think about when you're going to that location? You know, if I'm going shopping, especially if, if for some reason I'm going without my wife and I, I didn't write things down, I'm trying to remember what, I, what am I supposed to get because I didn't write it down. I'm, I'm running through, there's milk, there's eggs, there's ice cream, there's all sorts of sweet things, great pop. <laughs> That's what's on my mind. You know, if you're going to your friend's house, you might be talking, thinking like, okay, I, I'm going specifically to Lauren because I have X, Y, and Z that I want to cover. Or I want to hear about Lauren's last trip to wherever he took. If you're going to school, obviously you're going to be thinking about the test I have to take or the students that I have to greet or, or things of that nature. And so that's typically what happens. But what I want to remind you and I want to encourage you is what I feel like we see in the scripture today is that we need to make sure that we take Jesus with us wherever we go. Don't don't leave Jesus behind at home and say I'm going to the post office or I'm going to school or I'm going to my family house. Don't leave Jesus behind. Always make sure you take Jesus with you. Paul's done that really his whole ministry life. He's taking Jesus with him. He shared Jesus with every opportunity he's had um, and we need to do the same thing Paul is just a perfect example of somebody who is doing that so Acts chapter 28 verse 16 says it says when we got to Rome Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him so where is Paul at we're going to look at in just a second here recently we've looked at Paul where he was in Jerusalem and then he was taken to Samaria then he, last week he was board a ship was that last week or was that two weeks ago yeah, last week, uh, in Anchor's Way, he was aboard his ship on his way to Rome, and they got shipwrecked, and Paul was encouraging the people and sharing Jesus in that location. So he's finally getting to Rome, where he's going to be for at least the next two years, because it says in Acts chapter 28, verse 30, it says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house, and he welcomed people. So for the next two years of Paul's life, he's going to be in Rome. So, but Paul has been a guy who's taking Jesus with him wherever he, he went. You know, it started out in Acts chapter 9 when Paul first met Jesus. He's on his road to Damascus and he, there's this bright light and he falls off his horse or his camel or his donkey, whatever he's riding, and a voice talks to him says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And after, after that point, Paul puts his faith in Jesus and it says immediately he went into uh, Damascus, and he started preaching. Now that, that immediately could have been after a time in the, the desert and then he came back, or it could have been like immediately after he got saved, he turned around and he started sharing Jesus with the people he was just trying to persecute. He says, I got this good news. I can't keep it to myself. I've got to share it with wherever I go. So he started there. In Acts chapter 13 through 21, we traveled with Paul through three different long missionary journeys. And on these missionary journeys, we find that Paul's bringing Jesus with them. And he's sharing Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas have been beaten. They've been put in the prison. And they're in the stocks. And they're singing and praising song, uh, singing and praising in God, and we find that Paul gets, once once they sing, there's this earthquake, and Paul gets loose, and all the people do, and, and the Philippian jailer gets saved, and Paul is getting his wounds dressed in the home of the Philippian jailer. What is Paul doing there? He's bringing Jesus with him. He tells him, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. In the home of the prison guard, because anywhere is a place to, sh to talk about Jesus. Paul's been in sin Synagogues. Paul's been outside of synagogues. Paul's been in city streets. Paul's been in homes sharing Jesus. 
He, he, Paul's been in courtrooms. He's been loud and proud about his, his testimony, what he's gone through. This is what Jesus did for me in a rented lecture hall. You know, everybody would go to work, and then there's like this big snooze time, and then they would go back to work. And, and during that in-between time was, because Paul was a tent maker, during that in-between time, they would rent this hall, and he would share Jesus there because Jesus can be brought up anywhere, and then they would go back to work. And I'd even say aboard a ship. Paul was bringing up Jesus there. He was, he was get, providing hope to the people by saying God is going to get us through this. But Paul was not a guy who's going to stay silent. He was a guy with every opportunity, wherever he was at, he was taking Jesus with him and he was going to share Jesus with them. Paul has been wanting to get to Rome for a very long time. We read in Rome, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 13, as he's writing to the Romans from uh, when he was in Corinth, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. Paul has wanted to get to Rome. God has just not allowed those doors open for Paul to get there. So he's finally getting to go where he wants to go. Acts chapter 23, Jesus tells him, you're going to be my witness in Rome as you were in Jerusalem. When he's on the board of ship, God is reminding G Paul that he's going to make it there. And so now, Paul has finally made it to Rome. And where is Paul? He's in a rented home, but he's under house arrest. And he, he could be sitting there, you know, w making a ship in a bottle, right? He could just be writing letters. He could be reading. He could be pouting, looking out the window. But what does Paul do during that time? We read in verse 31 that he preached the kingdom of God and he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was, he couldn't go anywhere. He's like in prison. But every six hours, a new guard was chained to Paul. What do you think Paul was doing? He was, he was sharing Jesus at that time because Jesus can be brought up anywhere. He preached the gospel and he talked to the people. He couldn't go, but God brought the people and he says, okay, this little house, which is probably puny, is a great floor. It's a great opportunity to share Jesus with people. And then what does that remind us for today? is that Jesus can be brought up anywhere. We don't have to just wait until we're in church on a Sunday morning or in Awana on a Wednesday night or Bible study to talk about Jesus. We can talk about Jesus or bring up G anywhere as a location to, to talk about Jesus. Your place of employment is a place to talk about Jesus. The shopping center. I think about Walmart. And my wife is way more social than I am. Because when I'm in Walmart, I'm like, I'm looking for this item, I'm looking for that item, and I want out of here. My wife is willing to get involved in people's lives. Uh, I remember a couple of different times where she talks to people. And when she has opportunity, she's bringing up Jesus. I mean, she's not like, hey, here's the gospel, but she's working that into the conversation. Did you know when you're at church, you can talk about Jesus? Not just from the pulpit, not just from a Sunday school class, but after church when we all say goodbye and there's a great opportunity there to bring up Jesus. At a school activity, at, sitting in the bleachers at a basketball game is a good opportunity to bring up Jesus. At the post office, you can bring up Jesus there. At your family or your friend's house, you can bring up Jesus there. You know, I thought about asking kids up here to come up with an example of some place where you can bring up Jesus. Would any kid want to do that for an airhead? Come up here and tell everybody, here's a place where you can bring up Jesus. I got airheads. If anybody wants to come up. Okay, well, you missed out. Just know you could have had one. There's lots of places. You can bring them up on the playground. You can bring them up walking around town, at the skate park, at the swimming hole, right? Anywhere you can bring up Jesus. What I'm trying to say here is just make sure you put in your mind that I don't have to keep Jesus out of this, out of this location. Now I realize there are places where you are not supposed to bring up your faith. 
Right? I think about the school. You're not, you're not supposed to talk about Jesus there. Well, Jesus can be discussed at school. I mean, I've heard Jesus being discussed at school. Now, I'm not saying, Marcia, you start teaching a Sunday school class in your, your school class, because I don't start preaching to the kids on the bus. I mean, I'm a school employee, too. So whatever rules apply to Marcia or Nicole or Leslie or whatever apply to me, too. But there are conversations that can be had. Kids will bring it up some way or another, and you can find that opportunity and say, okay, let's go for it. Let's talk about Jesus in this kind of situation. But at some point in your life, even when they say it's not okay to bring up Jesus, you might feel God prompting you to break the law. Right? We all want to keep the law. I don't want to take it. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to lose my job. But God's law triumphs over, or trumps man's law. Right? So at some point, you're going to have to choose to obey God instead of man. And it could be costly. Think about what Paul went through. Paul was put in prison. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. There's other countries right now that are meeting underground. There are people who are afraid of everybody coming into that underground church. Is that person going to snitch on me? Am I going to be put in jail? Am I going to lose my house? Am I going to lose my family? Very, very costly. And it could cost you something. But every, lo is a place, every location is a place that can, Jesus can be brought up. And you think about costly and that, that price to pay. Well, what did Jesus do for me? Jesus went to the cross. You know, what's worse that's going to happen to me? I tell some kid about Jesus on the bus. I'm going to lose my job. I mean, I could. Oh, darn. Maybe I should try it. <laughs> right? It's not, I'm not going to get put in prison. You know, I'm not going to get a big blemish in my record. You know, it's just, it's like, oh, well. But there are people who have, have had to put up with a lot. Jesus went to the cross for me so that I could have eternal life. I might be called to do that for somebody else. But I just want to remind you, I remind myself that there is no place ultimately where Jesus is off limits. Every location that you go is a place to talk about Jesus. Anywhere, anyone can be an audience to hear about Jesus. Anybody of any age, of any race, of any color, of any anything, anybody can be an audience to hear about Jesus. Once again, verse 31 it says, boldly and without hindrance, he, meaning Paul, preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look here in just a second. He talked to the Jews who didn't want to listen. He talked to the Gentiles who would listen. But ultimately, it came down to anybody who came into Paul's presence was going to hear a message about Jesus. He was going to try to work that in and bring that up. So first of all, Paul talked to the Jews who wouldn't listen. They, they, uh, let me read uh, chapter 28, verses 17 through 20. So first of all, we see Paul shows up. And here's what Paul wants to share. It says, three, day, three days later, after Paul got to Rome, he called together the leaders of the Jews. He said, when they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against their people or against his, the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with chains. Paul just got to Rome. He's, he wants to inform them of what we've looked at over the last five chapters or so about when he got to Jerusalem, how he was, he was people were rioting, trying to kill him. Paul got put in prison in Jerusalem, how he, through his nephew, he was able to get rescued from this plot to take his life. He was taken to Caesarea, and from Caesarea, he's, he's there for two years or three years sharing the message about Jesus, talking to whoever came in, and finally made it to Rome after enduring a shipwreck. Paul's trying to explain to them what he's gone through. And it says it's because of my hope and my hope in... 
<laughs> it is because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound in this, with these chains. It's because of Jesus that I've gone through all this. And, it, and they, they hear the message. They say, we, didn't, we actually didn't hear about all that, Paul. We don't know really what's going on as far as that goes. But we would like to hear about what you believe. Because we've heard about this sect. We've heard about this belief system. And it's kind of stirring up all over the place. It says in verse 22, we want to hear what your views are. For we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They're, they're, and it's just true. Everywhere Paul has been and talked about Jesus, everybody's talking against this. And at first glance in verses, verses 21 through 23, it looks pretty exciting. Because it said, we, were, we don't want to hear about what you went through, Paul. We want to hear about what you believe. And it says, they, they'd set aside a time for a whole group of people to come to Paul to hear what he has to say. Because anywhere is a place to talk about Jesus. Paul says, I'm going to take advantage of that opportunity. Paul can't go anywhere. So God brings the people to Paul to hear that message. And so Paul starts to explain to them. Verse 23, it says, They arranged to meet with Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God. All day long, he's talking about Jesus. And he tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He says, This is what I know from the Old Testament scripture. You guys are Jews. These are scriptures that you guys are familiar with. You're looking forward to the Messiah. I'm proving you from Scripture that Jesus is the Messiah that you're looking for. He can't really do anything else but do that. I'm in chains. I got this guard hooked to me. I got a big audience. I'm telling you in this location all about Jesus. And it says in verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. And those groups of people started getting into discussions. And verse 25 says, they disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made this final statement. So we were finding lots of people are not hearing. They're not liking what Paul is saying. They're not accepting this. Even though scripture is there, they're not accepting that it's really true. And, it, and Paul quotes something that we find in Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. He says, this is from Isaiah. It says, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the hearts of this people callous. Make their ears dull. Make their eye, make and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Paul says, from Isaiah, says, I'm taking these five senses. You guys know how it is to talk to kids, or how it is to talk to your spouse. <laughs> you know, you hear the sound that's going into the eardrum. You know your kids hear the noise. They, they can't help it. This, the hearing test proves that they can hear. The ear hears the sound, but it's, it's going in one ear and out the other. Right? They're not, they're not paying. They don't, they don't seem to understand what they're hearing because there's nothing that comes from it. I know that you heard me because I said it. They see with their eyes. And, and he's saying this is from Scripture. You can see with your eyes. Paul is showing them or telling them from Scripture. You see with your eyes, but it's not changing anything. It, it, you're not taking what you hear and believing it, and it's not changing your life. That's what Paul is saying. This is what you guys are. You're hearing what the words that are coming out of my mouth, but it doesn't mean anything. You can see, but it's not changing anything. So, like I said, in one ear and out the other. But you got to know and notice two things about this. First, you have to know that Paul was not responsible for the, for the change in these people's lives. He, all Paul can do is to share the message. You think about how much pressure that would be for the, the speaker or the preacher or the teacher. If you give the information... You know, in, in school, you know, you're teaching kids and you, you tell them, this is how you do the math assignment, and you show them, and you show them, and you show them, and they flunk the test. Who's responsible for that? I, don't, I would not say it's the math teacher's fault. If you've explained it to them, and then they take the test and they flunk it, you know, Paul is not responsible for those people's lives. And so, when you have opportunity to talk about Jesus, you're not responsible for how somebody else is going to respond. All you can do is speak the words. But also notice that Paul didn't quit. He didn't stop. He didn't say, boy, my own people, they're not listening to me. I've gone through this and that, and I'm tired of talking to people. I'm done. They can all just go to wherever. I don't really care. 
Paul did not stop. He said, okay, plan A did not work. This, this, this group that I am aiming at didn't want Jesus. We're going to see that Paul goes somewhere else. And he talks to people who will listen. But before we get to that point, we got to recognize that what Paul went through could be our experiences too. When you talk to people, they may hear the sounds that you're saying. They hear the voice that's coming out of your lips, but they may not accept it. They may not believe it. There are people who are not going to listen to what you have to say. You know, in churches today, all around the world, there are people who are sitting in, in the pews. Probably less than normal, kind of like here. But they're sitting in churches all around the world, and they're hearing the noise coming out of the speaker, out of the preacher's mouth, out of the teacher's mouth. But that's it. All it is is ear noise. Just as much as a cute baby noise, right? That's all it is, is just noise coming in to the head. There are people listening to sermons online. David Jeremiah, Alistair Begg, and they're listening to these. They could be doing homework while they're watching. They could just be baking a cake while they're watching. They could just be staring at the TV. But all they're doing is having an intake. They're just hearing it. That's it. But they're not going to do anything with it. People are sitting in uh, re religious services, revival meetings, concerts. They're hearing the message. They're hearing the songs. But that's it. It's going in. It's just hearing information. But there's nothing different. That's why there's a lot of unsaved people who are still unsaved. They hear the message that you, you need Jesus. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. But that's it. They don't do anything with it. That's why a lot of people are saved, but their lives are no different from when they first got saved. They still struggle with the same habits. They still do the same things that they're not supposed to. It's, I mean, I, I realize nobody's perfect. I'm not saying that, but there's a lot of people who could be a lot closer to living like Jesus if they did not just hear it and say, that's nice. And they, they weren't like the people that we read in... Uh, and James, where they, he says, do not just listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. But they get to the point where they hear it. They're seeing it, but that's it. A lot of people that you talk to are not going to listen. And that could discourage you. You know, it's, it's really discouraging if you feel like nobody cares what you have to say. Whether I'm talking about a baseball team. Or, or whether I'm talking about Jesus, or whether I'm talking about my vacation or my sickness. If nobody cares, it's really hard. It's the same way of talking about Jesus. If people don't care, it can be very easy to get discouraged. Eyes are glassed over, people looking at their watch, or playing on their cell phone, all sorts of stuff like that. It could be easy to get discouraged. Paul didn't let that stop him. He says, okay, you're not interested, that's fine. I'm going to find somebody who is interested in talking about Jesus. Who is interested? Paul says in verse Acts chapter 28, verses 28 to 31, he says, uh, Therefore I want you to know, he's talking to the Jews, that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. So for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the good news of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, Paul's telling the Jews, okay, you guys are interested, fine. I'm washing my hands. Jesus told his disciples, you go into one town. You share Jesus with them. If they don't want it, you shake the dust off your feet and you go. The, you know, there's not enough time to spend your whole eternal, your whole life with one person to share Jesus. Yes, you want to, but there's more people who need to hear that message. And that's what Paul did. You're not interested? Fine. I'm going to find somebody else. He just did not get discouraged to the point where he said, I'm not doing anything at all. Paul was a, a messenger of God to the Jews and to the Gentiles. When uh, he first was blinded by that light on the road to Damascus, a guy by the name of Ananias was supposed to go give Paul back his sight. And God told, or Jesus told Ananias this, Go, this is my children, chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. So Paul didn't care, Jew or Gentile. We've seen rich, we've seen poor, we've seen sick, we've seen healthy. I mean, anybody and everybody was in a potential audience to hear about Jesus. 
and there were people who listened. And I have to encourage you, you know, if you tell enough people about Jesus, at some point in your life, I would almost guarantee you somebody is going to listen. You might have more failures before you have successes, but there's going to be people who hear about Jesus who, who are going to change their lives. There's people sitting in church right now who are hearing something from God's Word, and there are people who are saying, I'm going to put this into practice. Yes, I know somebody who needs Jesus. I'm going to share Jesus with them. Yes, I need to stop the sin, and so I'm going to stop the sin. Yes, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus, and so I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. There are people who are listening right now who are going to put this into practice. People are listening online who are going to do more than just here. They're going to do it. People, uh, anywhere you go where the gospel is being preached, there is somebody who is going to hear and put it into practice. And it may be the people that you expect to listen. You know, Paul is going to his own people, the religious people who have everything. Like, Jesus comes to the Jewish people. They sh they're looking for the Messiah. They should be ex expecting this and accepting this. The Gentiles have no idea. They're going through life. They're believing whatever gods that they want. They have no idea. As so you would say, the Jews should expect, but the Gentiles, you wouldn't expect them to have any idea. But the Jews don't want it, the Gentiles are expecting it. And you can find the same thing in life today. There's jailbirds. People who are in jail at the end of their rope who hear about Jesus and they'll get saved in jail and they'll change your life. And sometimes it's the preacher's kid who will hear Jesus his whole life and want nothing to do with it. I can say that. I'm a preacher's kid. I've known preacher's kids who I went to church every single Sunday. I had to go and I, but then when they get out of the house, they want nothing to do with that. Who should be accepting this here? <laughs> the preacher's kid should be accepting this, but they don't when the jailbird will. The druggie who's at the, who's giving them drugs self, you know, at the end of the rope, they're, they're in a desperate situation, will turn to Jesus when the sorority student won't. The one who has all the A's, who has all the grades, who has it made won't turn to Jesus. The prostitute who's done and lived through every horrific event in life will turn to Jesus when the, break, the bank president won't. So don't, you can't look and say, you're going to get saved and you're not going to get saved. You just look and say, there's a bunch of people. There is an opportunity to hear about Jesus. And I'm going to share Jesus. You have no idea who's going to accept or when they're going to accept. Anybody is an opportunity. Anybody is an audience to hear about Jesus. It just is a matter of if you are the person who's going to open up your mouth and say something. So what are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell people about Jesus? Okay, Josh, you've got me almost convinced that everybody's an audience for Jesus. What am I going to tell them? Well, first of all, 1 Peter 3.15 says we all have the responsibility to tell people about Jesus. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. You want to try a fun exercise as a family or as couples or friends? Talk to somebody and, and say, what would you... Okay, Steve, if I was, if you were to, if I was to ask you, Steve, um, what, why do you have hope in Jesus? What would you tell me? <sighs> Or, here's exactly what I would tell you. Do that around the lunch table today. See what your, your kids say. Do they know what they would tell them? Can you articulate it yourself, what you would tell somebody? Here's what you can tell them. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, why did Jesus die? Why did God send his Son to die on the cross? Well, that's a good question, because the Bible says that we believe on Him, we will have eternal life, but why do I need to believe on Him? Why do I need eternal life? Well, Romans 3.23 says, we have all sinned. We've all sinned. We all know that. Okay, so what's the big deal about that? Well, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. So, Josh, because you sinned, you deserve to die and go to hell. That's why you need to know the good news that Jesus died on the cross that you find in John 3.16. And if you put your faith in Jesus, you can have eternal life. It can be that simple. You can work with those three verses. John 3.16, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23 to share Jesus. 
So that's the first thing you can do. What are you going to tell them? You can share the good news from Scripture. I just gave you a couple examples. Paul did that. In verse 23, he says... Uh, he says he tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Paul's trying to use scripture to convince these people about Jesus. So if you can use scripture to explain to people their need for Jesus, you're, you're, that's a good start. What else can you do? You can share what Jesus did for you. If you say, I got saved, I remember back in 19... I don't even know what I would, what it would be for me, but it was 19 something, you know. I I got saved, and I'm not the man that I was then. I don't. I mean, my biggest accomplishment or change in my life was worry, stress, anxiety, like throwing up before school. I was so nervous and worried about nothing, and now I'm like, okay. I remember when I was like 20 years old, Romans 8, 28, 29. God's working it all out for good. Yes, it's still easy to worry, but if I can hang on to that verse, I know God has a plan for it. So yes, I got in a car wreck. Yes, I got fired from my job. Yes, I got this. I was not expecting, but I know God has a plan. And it just totally relaxed me. I mean, even though I knew that verse my whole life, it just sunk in when I was 20 years old that God is in control. So I, I can say, this is what Jesus did for me. I have a testimony that I can share. I don't struggle with this anymore. I don't do that anymore. I have hope now when I didn't have hope before. But you, those, that's talking to unsaved people. But we talked about how anywhere is a location to talk about Jesus. Anybody is an audience to hear about Jesus. You can talk to people who are saved as well. Last week, we talked about hope in the storm. And I, I was talking with Leslie this week, and she did that. She talked to somebody who was saved about hope in the storm. They're, they're talking about something they were dealing with with stress and with worry. And she brought it up and said, you know what? Really, we're learning. We heard just in Sunday last week how God is in control, how God has a plan. And you can share that scripture with the saved person. I said last week, some people want to say it's all a cliche. God's in control. God loves you. God's working it out for good. Call it a cliche if you want to, but it's still true. So you can speak truth into the unsaved person's life to say, you need Jesus. But you can speak truth into my life or the truth into the lives of other people. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is profitable. It's not just for the unsaved person. It's for the saved person as well. To teach us, to instruct us in our learning. Well, how do I am supposed to live my life? I see that in Scripture. To rebuke me. To convict me of my sin. Oh, I'm not supposed to steal. Oh, I'm, I'm not supposed to take God's name in vain. Oh, I'm not supposed to. And it, it shows me where I'm wrong. It corrects me. It shows me how do I make my life in a right relationship with God. If I confess my sins, He's going to forgive me. It teaches me how to live training righteousness, how to live a righteous life before God. You can use that in your own life, but you can also share Scripture with saved people that you know are, are saved as well. It is not just for the unsaved person. God's Word is for everyone. So, as you go through your life, you go through those top five places that you go every single day or every single week. You're, you're going to coffee. You're going to work. You're going shopping. You're going to church. You're going to a school activity. I want to encourage you uh, to, uh, to remind you of these things. One is that anywhere can be a location to talk about Jesus. It doesn't mean every time you open up your mouth, everywhere you go, you're going to. But just don't automatically limit that place and say, I don't have to think about Jesus here because it's not okay. Because it is okay to talk about Jesus anywhere. And anyone can be an audience. You know, on Wednesday night with little kids, you know, who barely understand anything, they're an audience. The older adults in Bible study, they're an audience. Anybody, at wherever you're at, family, friends, basketball, at the lake, at the shopping, at the surprise location where you meet somebody new, they could be a potential audience to hear about Jesus. So here's what I want you to take home with you today. 
Take Jesus wherever you go. You're already going there. Jesus is already there. He's not. He's omnipresent. Omnipresent. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's already there. But just remember that he's there with you. And you use the opportunity that God gives you to share Jesus with everybody. That's what he's called us. That's what he called Paul to do. That's what he's called us to do. He just asks that we be faithful and take Jesus with us and share him. And we have opportunity to do that. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. God, I know that even today's message, it's, it's a hopeful one because, God, we know that you love us and you're with us wherever we go. I know it's scary, God, because I know there's places where we're really, according to what man says, we're not supposed to bring up Jesus. We know that not everybody's interested in hearing about Jesus, and we don't want to offend people. We don't want to, to have repercussions from it, God. But, I, God, I know you're already everywhere, and you just ask us to take those opportunities that you give us to share Jesus. Jesus. And I pray for myself, and I pray for everybody in this room that we would do that well this week. Throughout whatever days you have left, that we would take the opportunity to talk about you because of the world that needs to know you as their Savior, and even for the, the saved who need to have encouragement from your word and the hope that you offer us. God, I thank you for this message, and I pray for the ability to do it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.